great to be in the house of the Lord. Even though it's the, the Lord's gym, it's still the house of the Lord with God's people. And uh, we, we rejoice in the fact that we can come together and, and worship. You know, I want to I take just a moment here and kind of mention the, the time that we live in. Man, 2020 just doesn't stop giving, does it? Um, we live in such times of such chaos and just craziness in the world. And speci specifically, you know, this week we've seen all of what's happening with the, uh, the death of, of George Floyd. And, uh, you know, what... I know many of you have had tons of conversations around this. There's all kinds of issues of justice and race and all, you know, all these things that come up around this. And when I look at this, number one, I think what we, what we recognize is that we as a church and believers need to take this seriously because life matters. Life matters and all life matters. And all life matters because we are created in the image of God. And George Floyd's life mattered, okay, because he had the image of God on him. And we need to recognize that the image of God is not um, just placed on one race or one group or one sex. That the image of God is, is, is applied to all races, men and women and, and, and all ages. And therefore, we need to be mindful that life matters and life is valuable because of the image of God placed, placed upon us. And, and, I, and you know, all of the law enforcement agencies and everybody come, has come out and basically condemned the actions that the officer um, uh, was involved in that led to his death. And so it should concern us. It should sadden us. We should mourn. We, we should. We should be in conversations that matter, all right? around this but it also tells us this it, it, it shows us that we live in a world that's broken we just you just see depravity we, we see depravity on the, the that specific police officer that um that used excessive force in a way that that wasn't right that led to his death that's that's depravity but when you look at the response that we've seen in the world with all of the, i mean the world in our in our nation with riots and you know, people burning down cities and police cars and, and uh, city halls and targets. And wh where is that coming from? Well, it's coming from anger and injustice and so forth. Well, let me ask you this. Where does justice come from? It comes from God. God. And therefore, when you look at this response, this is, <laughs> the action was unjust. And the response that we've seen in our nation is unjust. And so we as a church, we need to be mournful over the brokenness in our world, the depravity in our world. Um, what's the answer to, to, you know, to this whole issue? I, I, I don't know. What, what's the church's right response in its fullness? I don't necessarily know. I think that's something we're going to be uh, delving into. But I do know this is that life matters. And the only place that justice and grace and healing is going to come from is from the Almighty. You know, you know when, when Jesus came, he didn't just come to fix racism. He didn't just come to fix um, poverty or he didn't just come to fix well, you know, all these other systemic issues that are in our world. Jesus came to fix the problem that causes the problem. He came to address sin and depravity. And so he's our hope. He's our hope in this world. And so as just pastor this morning and as we gather together in the church, I just want us to, to recognize we live in a broken, sin-filled world, but we have a hope. There is a hope. There, we, we have a Savior. We have a Redeemer. Our, our, our God has come to earth to love us, to, to redeem us, to 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 um, fix the brokenness and to heal our land. And while, you know, a lot of people have called out for governors to do this and mayors to do this and failures all the way around, okay, granted, maybe, maybe not. The answer to the problem that's causing this mess is not going to be found in any White House or State House or anywhere else. It's going to be found in the person of Jesus Christ. And so it's going to be found most clearly in God's house. And so that's going to start with prayer. And so I'd like for us to start with prayer this morning. 
Okay. Father, our hearts are broken. Because of the brokenness of our land, our hearts are broken because of the, um, the unrest in our world. Our hearts are broken over the family of George Floyd who lost someone that they love, someone that shouldn't have died, someone that matters, a life that matters. And if we're going to stand for life that matters in the womb, we've got to stand for the fact that all life matters because we are a reflection of your glory as we reflect your image. And so, Lord, I pray for the brokenness and for the unrest and for the, just the sinfulness and the response of uh, the rioting in, in our land. Lord, bring peace. Bring peace. And when there, where there is just anger, Lord, I pray, Father, that you will bring just, just healing that will cause us as a people, a nation that has every tribe, tongue and people group it seems that you would create a oneness amongst us and that oneness is not going to come because we all line up in some political party that oneness is only going to come as we look to Jesus Christ together and you bring it and so we ask you to bring it we ask you as a church to give us wisdom to know how to love those around us how to love those how to love each other all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And so we just ask you to work in our lives, Father, and in our land for your glory. We praise you this morning in Christ's name. Amen. I'm grateful for the, for him that tells about the love of God and how much that he loved us and what he did for us on Calvary and about the mercy that he gives us and to have their new every day. Would you stand? Let's sing four verses this wonderful hymn. Would you sing with me? Years I spent in vanity and pride, and caring not my Lord was crucified, and knowing not it was for me he died. I said I learned Then I trembled at the law I spurned Till my guilty soul imploring turn To Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free And pardon there was multiplied to me can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. And oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. The grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God dispanned at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing yes I will sing I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing of the mercies of the Lord and with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness thy faithfulness 
my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. And with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord for I will sing, yes, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Obnance and all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakness, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood beneath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy His mercy is more. Father, we bless you and thank you for your mercies. I thank you that you looked down on us. And you saw the need to send your son. We bless you today that we're able to worship. We can come together as a church. And we have the freedom to do that. Lord, we miss the times that we were not with our family our church family. But we're so grateful today that you've let us return. 
And so I praise, I ask you that you'd bring your people back. I pray that you'd be with those that are sick, those that need your touch, those that, that are just so concerned about a loved one today. And there's many, many, many needs that we have as a church body. And so we're grateful for um, seeing us through um, this day and what will, it will all detail and hold. I pray for Brother Bradley for your word, that it would just pierce and it would move, convict, and uh, be with all those that are listening, wherever they might be traveling on home or whatever. God, speak through your servant today. And we ask you that you lift him up to you. To you in Jesus name I pray amen well, you may be seated Savannah is going to help her daddy out today and I asked her that she would come and share and so her and Josh are going to share a beautiful song would you listen as they share together amen I hope you're encouraged by the song today as we consider together who Christ is to us in his fullness the song's called Christ is mine forevermore that God has numbered I was made to walk with him yet I look for worldly pleasure and forsake the king of kings but mine is hope in my redeemer though I fall his love is sure for Christ has paid for every failing, and I am his forevermore. Aren't you thankful for that? And mine are tears in times of sorrow, and darkness not yet understood. I must travel where I see no earthly good. But mine is peace that flows from heaven and the strength in times of need. I know my pain will not be wasted. Christ completes his work in me.
What a blessing. What a blessing. Well, let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word. It's been a few weeks since we've been in 1 Timothy, so let's go back there. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 4. So you take your copy of God's Word, open to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And as you do, I want to mention one more thing that I didn't mention when I got up and made a statement earlier. Uh, depravity is a reality. And because depravity is a reality, God has given us an, another gift and it is our, our police officers. It's our law enforcement. If there was no depravity in the world, we wouldn't need law enforcement. It would all be perfect. But we're not. And so as a church and as a people, we, we can find a place where we can mourn the kind of tragedy that happened with, with uh, George Floyd and his life. And at the same time, respect our law enforcement officers and, and abide and, and honor them as well. Uh, but this morning, okay, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're reading verses 1 through 5. And so let me invite you, I'm going to move this. Let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word and move there, verses 1 through 5. Uh, let's stand to honor the, read, the reading of God's Word, and then I'm going to get on my knees and ask for God's blessing over it. And I invite you to join me there if the Lord gives you grace to do so. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. That's just the version that I use. You follow along in the version that you use. 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the ins insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Pray with me. Father, what two great gifts that you've given us, the word of God and prayer that allow us to abide with you, to know you, to follow you, to find joy in our relationship with you. So Father, I pray now that you would guide us and you would make us strong as believers and as a church. Lord, I pray that I might preach in a way that would reflect your word, that, but your spirit would speak far loudly. It speaks far more loudly and far more powerfully than I ever could. I have nothing to say unless you say it and have said it. So we ask you to say it clearly to us this morning and accomplish your will and your people. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Now, those of you that have known me for a number of years uh, probably know that I'm not a big fan of boats. I have talked about that in the past. The biggest reason I'm not a big fan of boats is because I have a, ten I have a tendency to be claustrophobic and motion sick. And so that's not a good combination when it, when it comes to boats. Um, but, uh, well, and any, of you, uh, any of you that have gone to Honduras on that trip uh, have, have helped know that about me and many of you nurses and pharmacists and doctors have helped this brother out so I want to thank you very much uh, for that but it might surprise you then understanding some of my issues that uh, if I were to say my favorite family vacation to take is a cruise is a boat is a ship let's be very clear about that but uh, why is that 
if I have all these issues with boats? Well, the reason is, is because as a pastor, you know, pastors are on 24-7. We can get a call anytime, and we understand that. And if you take a vacation that you can drive back to, you're going to get a call. If there's an emergency, you got to drive back, unless you're out in the middle of an ocean. And everybody knows if you're leaving to go on a cruise, no one can get you. Bradley cannot get back. And so if, God forbid, somebody dies, Mike is doing the funeral. I cannot get back. And so for me, it allows me to, to really rest. I mean, just finally, at, 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 that's just one place that we found that, that I can just kind of unwind and just read and listen to music, spend some time with the Lord, you know, watch some shows, do the things with my family. And it's, 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 that's really a blessing to me. Now, I have never been on a, a cruise where when it was over, I said, boy, I'm ready to get back home. I'm glad that's over with. Never. Now, it's happened all the time on Disney World. You know, after the first day, I'm exhausted. Are we done yet? That was only the first day. No. But uh, when it comes to the cruise, I mean, you've got a, a, a all-you-can-eat food, all-you-can-eat ice cream, seafood, steak. Why would anybody want to leave that? Which is the issue that Paul's bringing up today with Timothy when it comes to the Christian faith. Why would anyone want to leave the Christian faith? I mean, it's too good. It's too glorious. It's, it's too much of a blessing walking with God, understanding salvation, understanding forgiveness and, and life and joy and peace and all the fruits of the Spirit. Why would anybody want to leave that? And yet Paul tells Timothy, rest assured, young man, they will. They will leave. He prepares them. Look at verse 1. He says, now the Spirit expressly says in latter times, some will depart from the faith. We don't know exactly how the Spirit expressly said that, whether the Spirit just gave a revelation to Paul or whether there was some other type of uh, um, prophecy that was given that the church understood it. But what we do understand is that it was, when it was given, it was really, really, really clear. Very clear, and Paul wants Timothy to understand that this is not some ambiguous prophecy. It's not something that might happen. God said that there will be people in Christ's church who, prof who are professing believers, who are professing Christians, that will indeed walk away from the faith. Do not let that surprise you. It is going to happen. Expect it, he says. And it's something that happens as soon as Christianity became a faith, as following Jesus became a, a thing. People, people started, would follow for a while, a while and then fall away. He says here it's going to happen in latter times, but he's not talking about some distant future out, out there. When, when you read uh, in the Bible phrases like in latter times or in the last days, he's talking about the time that begins when Jesus ascends back to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Okay, that begins the, these last times or, or last days. And so Paul's telling Timothy, this is something that you are going to have to deal with. I mean, after all, it's even something that Jesus had to deal with. I mean, Jesus had a number of people that followed him for a time, but then got disenchanted with Jesus because Jesus wasn't who they thought he would be or who they wanted him to be. And then they left him. Uh, Paul had dealt with that as well. He experienced some of his closest friends ultimately leave the faith. Uh, Demas comes to mind there. And as we look in our day, we, think, we see that look, this hasn't stopped happening in the church that we live in, in the times that we live in. Only a few months ago, Joshua Harris, who is a famous pastor and author, he wrote some books that maybe you read, uh, I Kissed Dating Goodbye or Dug Down Deep. Uh, he left the faith. He apologized for, well, let me just, let me just read um, what jo Joshua Harris says uh, in, in leaving the faith. This came out of Revelant Magazine, uh, dot com interview that he did with him. He said, by all measures that I have, I have for defining a Christian, I'm not a Christian. Many people tell me that there are a different way to practice faith, and I want to remain open to this, um, but I'm not there now. He also added to the LGBT community, I want to say that I'm sorry for the views that I taught in my books as a pastor regarding sexuality. Joshua Harris, very respected in the church for a long time. Um, a few years ago, uh, a Christian artist named Derek Webb 
Uh, he, he sang for a, a band a number of years ago, back when I was in college, I, I enjoyed called Cadman's Call. Um, not Cade, yeah, Cadman's Call. And uh, then he came out on his own, and he was, a, he was an excellent artist. He had great theology in his music. I enjoyed listening to Derek Webb, and yet he left the faith. Um, a few months ago, some YouTubers that uh, a number of young people uh, enjoy watching, uh, Rhett and Link, I don't know if you all are familiar with Rhett and Link, but uh, they left the faith. Now, they did a number of interviews about how they grew up in church. They grew up going to youth group. They were taught all the right things, so forth. And yet, they now reject a belief in God. Just this past week, John Steigerd, who is the lead singer of the Christian contemporary group Hawk Nelson, expressed that he had left the faith. He wrote this, after growing up in a Christian home, being, being a pastor's kid, playing and singing in a Christian band and having the word Christian in front of most of the things in my life, I'm now finding that I no longer believe in God. And so when, when I just was, I was familiar with, with most of these folks that had left the faith, it got me thinking about, well, I wonder who else has left the faith that I don't know about. So I, I did a study, and this is what I found, that there's a number of folks that are, quote, celebrities that were once Christians that have left the faith, sometimes to other religions, sometimes to no religion. For example, Tina Turner converted from Baptist to Buddhist. John Travolta was raised Catholic, but now is a very famous Scientologist. Uh, Russell Brand was a Christian comedian, George Harrison of the Beatles, uh, both converted from Christianity to Hinduism. Uh, those conver others converting from Christianity to a non-belief in God, such as just agnosticism, we don't know or don't believe kind of thing. Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Britain in, uh, during World War II, highly respected man. Richard Dawkins was once a believer before, before he became one of the most famous atheist or connected to a church before he was one of the most became one of the most famous atheists in our day. Brad Pitt was raised Southern Baptist and then became agnostic and I uh, found out looking at a number of different sites there that uh, that he is now following some type of new age believism. Folks Paul told us that the spirit told us People are going to leave the faith. They're going to claim Christianity and then reject Christ. Don't let that surprise you. But I think what's even more interesting than that, because that's been happening ever since people have been following Jesus, is, is why Paul says that people depart from the faith. Let's, let's continue to look at this verse. He says, now the Spirit especially says that in latter times someone will depart from the faith. How do they do it? By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So Paul says that when they depart from the faith, in whichever really way that they, they go, that they are following deceitful spirits in the teachings of demons. Now, what's funny about that, in all the study that I did this week, looking at people who had left the faith, I didn't see any that said, I've left following Jesus to follow demons. I didn't find any that, that expressly said that they were doing that. But Paul says that the reason people leave the faith and, and follow some other teaching is that they are caught up in a demonic agenda to lead them away from Christ, from Christianity, and from the Word. <clears throat> that there is this demonic agenda that, that the spirit demonic deception that the goal is to lead us away from Christ. And so how do demons do that? How do demons, how are they so deceptive? Now, I need to make a caveat because what I'm going to say after this kind of goes a different direction, but I need to, I need to set something up here. Because what Paul's about to say is that demons lead people away from Christ via false teaching, via false teachers. But as we've just said, not everybody that leaves Christianity leaves because of false teaching. Sometimes people leave Christianity because they actually understand the truth. Like, for instance, Joshua Harris. 
Joshua Harris understands the gospel. There's no question about that. You read his books. You, you listen to him teach before. He, he, he understands the gospel. As a matter of fact, what he said was when he came out against this, he said, look, I, I understand what Christianity is, and I realize that I am not a follower of Christ. So he actually said, I excommunicated myself. And so when the Word of God clarifies who believers are and who non-believers are, that's a good thing. Well, please, please hear me. When the Word of God, the true gospel, brings clarity to what a true believer is and what a, a non-believer is, that is a good thing. But it is a not a good thing when false teaching via false teachers leads to a type of demonic confusion and confusion about who Christ is and who God is causes people to leave the faith. That's not, that's not good. And that's what he's ultimately going to, to point at here. And so as we think about this issue of false teaching and, and um, demons using false teachers to, uh, to confuse people's understanding of who God is, we need to realize this is a warning for those of us who teach. This is a warning for pastors and elders who teach the church. It's a warning for Sunday school teachers that lead your class and those who lead discipleship studies and men's groups and women's groups and small groups. It is, it is, this is a warning that we need to be very careful that we are not being used in a demonic deception to lead people away from the truth, but that we're actually leading people to the truth. It's why he says in verse 16, and we'll deal with this much much more detail in, in coming weeks. He says, chapter 4, verse, 13, verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself. It's Paul talking to Timothy. Keep a close watch on yourself. Talking about your life and on the, on the teaching. You know what? He doesn't say your teaching here. He says the teaching because the teaching is the word. It doesn't change, right? Keep a, keep a close watch on yourself and the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. So what we teach about God matters because what we teach about God influences how ultim ultimately how other people follow him, what they believe about God and, and how they follow him. Now let me be, be very clear. It's not the power of any teaching that converts a heart and a life and, and causes a person to be born again. That's, we understand that's a work of God, that God has to come into the heart and the power of God to, uh, to regenerate the heart, to cause repentance so that we return from sin and put faith in Christ. That is a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Um, no question about that. But we also realize that God uses means of grace to bring about that. And preaching and teaching is one of the means of grace that God uses to create believers. As a matter of fact, it's the main means by which God uses to create uh, believers. And therefore, if we get that wrong when we teach people, then it can cause a crisis of faith for those that we teach that ultimately causes them to depart from the faith. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit more, but I, I, want you to, I want you to see something before we move much further. He says that as you're watching your teaching and your, and your faith, make sure that you don't let your consciences become seared. Because that's, one of the, that's the mark that marks these, these false teachers, is that they, are, they teach falsely, and they're able to do that because they have seared consciences. Verse 2, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So, it kind of tells us how they become false teachers. Is I don't think any teacher, well, I don't know. Most teachers don't go out and say, I'm going to become a false teacher today. I'm going to teach false doctrine. I'm going to teach wrongly. I'm going to teach people away from God. I think, you know, many that teach falsely have good intentions with it. But their consciences are seared. What great imagery. I mean, if something is seared, what does that mean? It means it's so damaged that you can't feel it anymore. Right? It's so damaged. Like if you were to, 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 to touch a, a, a 
skillet or a grill with your hand and it would singe all the nerves in your hand and so ultimately that that maybe it becomes numb it's what it means to be seared so damaged that you can't feel it anymore and what Paul is saying about these false teachers is that their consciences are so damaged so that when they teach this garbage that they're teaching they should have that little inner voice in their in their inside that says hey man this ain't right Hey, you should know that what you're teaching is contrary to truth and what God desires. You should, you should know that. But their conscience is so seared that they can't, they don't listen to their conscience. They can't hear it anymore. And I think there's two causes that might cause a conscience to be seared. Um, first of all, it's not knowing the word of God well enough to know that you're in error. Uh, I was thinking about how that might happen you know, there are people that grow up in cults. There are people that grow up in false religions. There are people that grow up uh, under false teaching, and they just always are taught that this is the truth. Well, if that's the case, a person might take that, might believe that, might start teaching that, and teaching it with great sincerity. But, you know, you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. And so we recognize that those kind of things might happen. But the kind of issue that Paul is bringing up here is not that issue. All right, because you notice he says that these false teachers teach through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So what he's saying there is that these are people that are acting out of a selfish motivation to teach this, this, this false gospel because it's in their best interest to teach it. So they don't care whether it's the truth. They don't care whether it's God's teaching or not. They're just teaching it because it's good for them for people to believe this and respond the way they're, they're teaching. Well, I think the most clear evidence for that in our, or the clear example of that in our day is the health and wealth gospel. Um, and this shows up in all kinds of different ways and all kinds of different um, venues and in churches, but maybe some of the most glaring were uh, Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis telling their church that the church needed to buy them a brand new jet so that they could fly around on private jets and share the gospel. The church need, I, I read that a while back and I thought to myself, what would happen if I asked Mount Gilead to buy me a jet? <laughs> hey, Mount Gilead, could I have a jet? No, right, no, no that's, that's not, not going to work, right? Because you know that there's something in your heart that, that recognizes the fact that, hey, um, following the God who stepped out of heaven, clothed himself in humanity, who bore our sin, who never had a place to lay his head, that died naked on a cross so that we might be restored right with God, that that's not about what kind of physical things you can get from God. That's about the treasure of knowing God and walking with God. And so we, we recognize that in this, this aspect of, of the problem with, with the health and wealth gospel. Now historically, there are two sides of errors in Christianity that people tend to fall into. It's either legalism or it's license. You know, and I, I think a lot of people have struggled with this issue of, of license before. Well, I think we've struggled with, with both these issues. But the issue of license would be this. Hey, look, if I'm, according to what you're saying, preacher, that I'm forgiven not because of what I do, but because of what Christ has done. And I'm forgiven of all of my sins, past, present, and future. Well, if that's the case, why can't I, what, who cares the way I live? I could just go sin it up. Right? I mean, I can just go live in complete debauchery because I'm forgiven, right? Well, Paul would respond to that error in Romans 6, 1, 2, saying, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. We've died to sin. How can we live it any longer? How can we still live in it? And so the Word of God addresses that error of license. But now the issue that Paul is dealing with here is the error of legalism the era of legalism. He says in verse 3 that these teachers, what are they teaching? They're teaching that we should not be married, who forbid, they're teachers who forbid marriage, verse 3, 
and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now, what a lot of the, the Bible scholars will say about this is this is the influence of Gnosticism on the early church or the early forms of Gnosticism. And that's just a big word to describe a religious philosophy that basically said this, that if it's physical, it's evil. If it's spiritual, it's good. And therefore, if you want to be a, a, a person that's in right with God, we need to reject the physical and only live in the, the spiritual. So any physical pleasure must be sin. Well, that, and that produced a lot of, a lot of legalism. You know? so, well, should, and the problem with legalism is that there's a real appeal to it. Particularly in our day, in people that live in the Deep South, I think we struggle far more with legalism than we do with license. Because it just, you know, this, this idea of, well, you know, like to use what the, the illustrations that they're using here, marriage. Well, if, if, I, if I'm not married, wow. Uh, and I show God that I give up all the pleasures that come with, come with marriage, the pleasures of having a family. I'm willing to give all that up. To show God how holy I am and how much I deserve heaven. So I'm willing to give that up. And not only that, I'm willing not to eat certain foods that, that particularly give wonderful pleasure. Man, that will really show God how holy I am if I give up a ribeye steak and pizza and I'm not willing to, to eat that stuff. And, and so maybe it's not those things for you, but maybe it's like the things, well, you know what? I, I'm going to pursue God in ways that, that I'm... that that make me feel like I'm acceptable to God. I'm not going to cuss, I'm not going to smoke, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to whatever, what, whatever you're gonna do around these things. Not gonna have sex before marriage, which, you know, all those things are fine things if we're gonna do that, but not for a legalistic motivation because we're not more acceptable to God because we don't do those things. We're acceptable to God for one and one reason only, and that is we are forgiven via the faith we have in Christ Jesus, who has become our righteousness. We are acceptable because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not because we have somehow earned it. But there is an appeal to earning it. There's an appeal to say, well, I deserve heaven because look at my life and look at that guy's life. He really doesn't. Look at her life. She doesn't deserve heaven. But I do, Lord, look at how I live. And what's the problem with it? What's the problem with all of that? Is none of it considers what God has said about what truth is and about who he is and about what he desires. We don't decide what makes God happy. We don't decide what truth is. As a matter of fact, we don't even know what God desires and what truth is unless God tells us which is why he's given us his word. And so what must we do to make sure we don't fall off into error? We must take every teaching that we ever hear or any teaching that we're about to teach and we're to look in God's word and see if what we are teaching and the lessons that we are drawing are consistent with what God's word teaches. That's it. Um, it's exactly why Paul commended the Berean Christians in Acts. He said, um, or Luke, I guess, talking in Acts. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word in all eagerness. How? Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So they were listening to Paul teach, and then they were looking to see the, see the teaching itself to say, well, is what Paul's saying truth? Well, how do you determine that? You look in the scripture, you see if it's consistent. And the problem with what was going on in the church in Ephesus, where, where, Paul, where Timothy is, when Paul's writing to him in, in 1 Timothy, is these this Gnostic teachings, false teachers that are, are starting to teach in the church, they're teaching something that's inconsistent with Scripture. So, essentially, Paul says to Timothy, what does the Scripture say about marriage and about eating food? He tells us that it should be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. He goes on in verse 4. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. 
Let me ask you this. How does Paul know that? Where does Paul get that? So we, we have it in the New Testament, right? But when Paul wrote this, they didn't have a New Testament, <laughs> right? So where does he get that? He gets it from the Old Testament, <laughs> right? He gets it from the Word. He gets it from the Scriptures that he had. And so where does the Bible teach that what God has created is good and it is to be received in thanksgiving? Genesis 1, right? Seven times in that refrain as God, as God creates this, through the six days of creation, he says, he looks, he, he, God creates and he saw that it was good. He creates and he saw that it was good. He creates the sky and the land, he looks, saw it was good. He creates the vegetables and he saw it was good. He looks, creates the animals, he looks, saw it was good. He creates humanity, Adam and Eve, and he looks back upon his creation and actually says there, and he looked and saw that it was very good, right? And, what, and he put them in the garden to enjoy all that God had created. And it was to be received with thanksgiving. So Paul says we're to look in the scripture and see what God says about truth. But when we teach about God in a way that goes against what God teaches about himself, it ultimately leads to confusion in what people experience in their world and thus leave the faith. Let me explain kind of how I think this happens and then we'll be done. I think people listen to teaching about God, and their pastor, maybe they read books or, or whatever. And then they go out and live their life. And when there's incongruence, when there's an inconsistency between what they've been taught should be true about God and thus what should be true about the world, when there's an incongruence there from what they think should be true and what is in reality happening, it causes an inward struggle in their heart. And ultimately, they come to the conclusion that, well, what I believe about God must not be right and thus they leave the faith. For example, now, this lead singer of Hulk Nelson, this came out just a week or so ago, so I, I, I draw him out. I, don't, I know he comes from a, a, a Christian home. I don't know anything about his pastor. I don't know anything about the teaching that he grew up in. But I do know that he brought up this issue, that how can there be a loving God with so much evil in the world? All right, that problem's been around forever. We've talked about that. There's, there's all kinds of ways to address that. Um, we, we realize those things. And here's, in some conversations with Brother Nolan and Brother Mike and some others, as we were thinking through these issues, this came up. If all you're taught about God is that God is loving, and you're not taught that, well, not only is God loving, but God is also just, and that there's sin in the world, and that we are sinners and God is holy, when you're talking about the love of God but not about the holiness of God, then you never get taught about the wrath of God. And you never understand that God would be perfectly just and perfectly righteous to come into the world and wipe out every single person on the face of the earth because we are sinful and the wages of sin is death. It separates us from God. God would be perfectly righteous to do that. If we only are taught that God is loving and we look in the world and we see evil in the world, there's an incongruence. There's like, I don't understand if this God that I've been taught about exists, why he allows these things to happen. And thus, you never get to the point where you understand that, yes, this world is sinful, this world is broken, this world is unjust and unholy, and we are unholy. And what God could have done was come and just demolish us all instead for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God is loving in the midst of being holy, in the midst of being a God of, of wrath over injustice, that he sent his son to save those who would believe from our sin at the cost of the life of his own beloved. 
And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if all you get is a little small microcosm of teaching about who God is, devoid of the big picture of who God is, you're going to look at that teaching, you're going to look at the world and say, that doesn't make sense, I'm leaving that God. Same thing happens with the issue of the, the health and wealth. And in that example I gave earlier about the planes and, and Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis, that's an extreme. Let me tell you what something's not extreme. It's this subtle teaching that happens within Southern Baptist churches, I think many, many Christian churches, that say this. If you're a good boy or girl, if you do what you ought to do, bad things shouldn't happen to you. I mean, you, you were raised in church, you keep going to church, you bring your family to church, you go on mission trips, you tithe, you do, you do what you're supposed to do. But then your child comes down with autism. Or your wife dies of breast cancer. And you think, well, this shouldn't happen to me because I did everything right. But we realize when we look in Scripture that there is nothing in Scripture that says believers are shielded from suffering. But what is in Scripture is that in the midst of our suffering, we have a God that will come and abide with us. That will bear us up. That will give us hope. That will give us strength. That will encourage our souls. Until all is made right in glory. And so if, if you think, well, I did everything right, and yet all this bad stuff still happened to me, God must not be real. You'll leave the faith. But here's the thing. <laughs> You're not really leaving the faith. Because what you had was never really the true faith once given to the saints. But here's what's tragic about that. People who leave the faith, people who leave a false view of the faith, rarely ever give the true faith another chance. They never give the truth the other chance. So when you go and talk to, oh, I've tried Jesus, oh, I've tried to follow the Lord, I tried, they never give it another chance. And so we need to be careful about our teaching. Make sure that our teaching is consistent with God's word because that causes people not to leave the faith, to put deep roots in truth that when things get hard, we taste even more distinctly the goodness of God. He ends up by saying this in verse 5. Talking about marriage and food that we eat. He says, anything God makes for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. It's the word of God in prayer that makes everything holy. It's the word of God in prayer that causes us to walk in holiness even when things are hard and bad. It's the word of God in prayer that dispels the lies of Satan's demonic agenda of false teaching. And it's the word of God in prayer that can bring anyone that will turn from sin and put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ home to glory. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we be faithful to it. Fight the devil. Father, You made it very clear that there would be false teaching that would ultimately lead to people leaving the church. Forgive us. As leaders, Father, as we've taught anything but the truth of your word, forgive us if we've allowed people to get a view of God that is not the true view of who you are. Forgive us, Father, when, when people have left the church and it's our fault because we were deceptive. We, we were more Satan's agents than yours. Forgive us for that. 
And may we never walk in that. Would you cause your teachers, father, and leaders, and not only teachers and leaders in the church, but also parents at home who teach and lead their own children to know the truth, to love the truth, to be willing to deal with the hard issues that occur in the world via the the worldview that the Word of God gives us. Because it's the only worldview that can make sense of the reality that we see. And so, Father, I pray for those in our, our midst today. Maybe they're struggling with some of these issues that I've brought up. They're struggling with evil in the world. They're struggling with injustice in the world, as we've already talked about. They're struggling with um, suffering that has come their way when they thought they did everything right. Remind us, Father, that you promised us that in this world there would be trouble. There would be tribulation. But you also said, but take heart, for I've overcome the world. You are loving and you are sovereign. And you love us enough that in your holiness and in your holy wrath, you sent your Son to absorb it so that we could receive his righteousness and know you forever. King Jesus, we say thank you and we praise you. And maybe you're here today and who knows, you might be in a place even like Joshua Harris that if he was, and it seems now by his own word, an unbeliever, even though understanding the truth clearly, an unbeliever, you don't have to stay there. The Spirit of God to do a miraculous work of changing your heart and bringing you home. You don't need just to be a believer and of an understanding of something in your mind. You need to be a fully devoted follower of Christ who treasures Christ above all things. Let that be your heart. And if that's you right now, if you need to to trust Christ that way, just you have a conversation with him. Uh, We're going to sing a hymn invitation in just a moment. I'm going to stand here. I'll be happy to pray for you. I'll be happy to counsel with you. Heavenly Father, as we struggle through, in, in many cases, the dark night of the soul, would you bring us out on the other end, seeing the light of your truth, the holiness of God and the love of God, who bears us up and causes us to persevere to the end. We love you, Father. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Maybe stand. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take All right. Um, Thank you so very much for worshiping with us today. And thank you, church, for continuing to give. 
Uh, Y'all have been so faithful to come by the church, sometimes just drop it into the drop box on the door, sometimes coming in, sometimes mailing it in, sometimes uh, giving it online. Y'all have been so very faithful in that, and that is so crucially important to our able to to continue forward as a church and a faith and making a difference in the world. So we ask you to continue to do that. There is a box outside. Many of you are starting to drop it in uh, the the box as as you leave, and we we thank you. We, We treasure that. All right, Brother Danny, is there anything else we need to take care of before we go? See you Wednesday night choir practice. All right, yes, we got a number of things coming up. Thank you. Uh, Wednesday night choir practice is going to be starting uh, this Wednesday. As this Wednesday, right? This Wednesday. This is Wednesday. As well as uh, we're going to be having a Sunday night. See, the women are going to be meeting in the worship center on Sunday night, and then the men are going to be meeting in the worship center on Wednesday night. We're also going to be having prayer meeting in here, and so you have some options on Wednesday night there. Um, We're doing everything that we can do under the guidelines that that we've been given that we want to abide by. We want to give you every opportunity to grow and worship. So come and be a part, and thank you for being here. I know you could be at home watching on Facebook, and many of you who are are watching on Facebook right now uh, are still, uh, you know, worried about coming to church. Completely understand that. We want you to know that when you feel comfortable, we want you to come. We have a place on the third floor if you're especially concerned that you can be to, be up there. But having, just as a preacher, being able to look out and preach to people, I didn't know how much of a blessing that was. But I do now. Yeah, I do now. Thank you for the blessing that you are to be here and worship. All right. Um, I'll close us with prayer. And as I do, I'll, and, and after I do, I'll just remind you, you're not dismissed, but you are sent. You are sent. Um, so we have the gospel. Let's go change the world with it. Uh, and as you, dis, as you are sent, dis, be sent from the back rows forward. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us and the word of God, which bears us up and prepares us for the work to be done. Send us out, Father, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.